before we were discussing a planar surface or flat plate in parallel flow. And now we're going to uh, address another subject. Uh, and we're going to, the geometry we're going to consider is a cylinder. So we're looking down the axis of a cylinder here. And we're interested in the cylinder in cross flow. And um, this is representative of another class of, of surfaces, really. You can think of the flat plate as uh, uh, representative of a class of surfaces that maybe had uh, small curvature, um, and we were mainly interested in uh, the, the flow parallel to the surface. And now we have an object that, compared to uh, the region that we're interested in, uh, has a rather large curvature and presents a uh, relatively flat face uh, to the oncoming flow. And these generally fall into a class of objects that in fluid mechanics we might call bluff bodies. And the defining characteristic for a bluff body is that we expect it to generate, uh, at least at reasonably high speeds um, of the flow, to generate a weight behind it. And we're familiar with this if we were to drag this cylinder through uh, a, a liquid uh, we would expect to see a weight trailing behind it. And in fact, in air uh, with flow uh, at any reasonable velocity over it, we would likewise expect to see a weight which we know just from our observations is uh, turbulent. So as we might expect, we uh, found before that the turbulence had a significant impact on heat transfer because it created a lot of advective mixing. And so uh, we would expect in this case that that ability of the body to uh, create this turbulent weight would likewise have a significant effect on um, heat transfer. And indeed, that's, that's what we'll find. But first, we want to consider just a little bit about why that weight would form. And we can understand the reason for uh, this weight formation and uh, what we refer to as the separation uh, of the boundary layer. Um, if we look at flow in the free stream around this um, uh, cylinder, so in other words, our boundary layer is, is some very thin region close to this uh, cylinder. And the boundary layer represents, as before, the region of flow where the surface has a direct influence on the flow, where it's pulling momentum out of the flow or where it's adding thermal energy to the flow. But now this larger object also has an effect uh, on the velocity um, outside of this boundary layer. So uh, we've now defined uh, two different velocities. We have a uh, velocity upstream V, which is our capital V for the upstream velocity, which is uniform. And then we have U infinity, uh, which is the what I'll call uh, local free stream velocity. And this velocity is going to vary depending on where I am in relationship to the, to the cylinder. If I considered myself at a point out here, u infinity would be equal to v. But as I progress around the cylinder, u infinity has to increase um, from continuity. Um, if I considered a, a section of flow uh, that um, flowed past the top half of the cylinder, that flow is compressed into a smaller area directly above the cylinder. And so therefore, from uh, if we consider this fluid to be relatively incompressible, from continuity, we know that uh, the free stream velocity here is significantly faster than it is here. Likewise, as the flow progresses past the, the cylinder, it, uh, the flow lines re-expand and the velocity uh, decreases. Well, if we then um, relate that to what we know about inviscid flow, um, specifically Bernoulli's equation, Bernoulli's equation, we said, uh, if we neglected the change in elevation, uh, we said that the static pressure uh, plus the dyna dynamic pressure, although I guess I guess I'm going to say u infinity right over two, um, was 
constant. In reality, of course, this is only true for inviscid flow. So where, where we don't worry about viscosity, which well away from the boundary layer, that's probably true. Um, and this is really just a statement of conservation of energy. But it tells us that um, if the velocity is increasing, if this is 0.1 and this is 0.2, and the velocity is increasing, then the pressure must be dropping. So whereas before, along the plate, we considered the change in P with respect to X to be zero, now we, from Bernoulli's equation, know we must have a change in pressure along the surface, a change in the static pressure, the free stream pressure. And so on the uh, front half of the cylinder, we would expect that change in pressure to be negative. In other words, pressure is decreasing as we increase our position along uh, the surface. And we call this what we would term a favorable pressure gradient. And we refer to it as favorable because the pressure at a position further along the flow is lower than the pressure um, behind that flow, if you will. And that tends to push the flow forward, push the fluid forward. The fluid is always flowing from a region of higher pressure to lower pressure. But now when we come to the, the back half of the, the cylinder and the flow lines start to re-expand, then Bernoulli's equation uh, tells us that the pressure gradient has to start increasing again. In other words, the pressure at this point now is lower than the pressure at this point. Now this is a, a problem. And we call this an adverse pressure gradient. Now, if there was no viscosity, this would be all we need to know and, and everything would work out fine. The uh, velocity that we had gained by accelerating on this side, uh, we would give back on this side and trade it for pressure. But the problem is we've lost momentum at the surface. The surface has pulled momentum out of the flow and slowed it down. And that means that now the flow near the surface no longer has the velocity that it needs in order to give up and regain that pressure that it's trying to act against. We're trying to now push flow uh, against pressure. Uh, the flow is flowing from a region of lower pressure to higher pressure. And again, that's okay as long as it has the velocity to give up, um, that momentum to give up to regain that pressure. But near the surface, it doesn't. And so eventually, the flow at the surface comes to a halt. And as the pressure increases more, that adverse pressure gradient drives flow in the opposite direction. And we get a flow reversal. So where the uh, pressure causes the flow at the surface uh, or above the, slightly above the surface to come to a halt, uh, we refer to that as the separation point because beyond that, we're going to get a flow reversal where the pressure gradient actually pushes flow in the opposite direction at the surface. And now we've created this curl in our vector field. We've created uh, a vortex circulation. And the boundary layer now no longer sits at the, the surface. We've separated the boundary layer from the surface and we've created this turbulent wake. And the process of the separation of the boundary layer is going to depend very strongly on the uh, condition of the boundary layer. Uh, so somewhat perhaps counterintuitively, um, a turbulent boundary layer, a boundary layer that's already um, experiencing turbulence, is less susceptible to separation. Although if we think a little bit about the physics, maybe this becomes clear why. Um, remember that the separation is being caused because we didn't have enough momentum at the surface to counteract this adverse pressure gradient. Um, so in a laminar boundary layer, um, the only way we can get momentum to the surface is by diffusion from the, the free stream. 
So we tend to have um, a, a low amount of momentum, a low uh, momentum density near the surface um, because we're diffusing, it's creating a gradient that's diffusing momentum to the surface. And so that makes it more susceptible to uh, separation. And we find for uh, relatively uh, low Reynolds numbers, uh, Reynolds numbers below the critical Reynolds number uh, for the generation of uh, turbulence in the boundary layer, and we refer to that Reynolds number now, Reynolds number sub d. Remember, this always tells us what the link scale is. So this would be uh, the velocity. Uh, the relevant velocity here is going to be the, the um, velocity describing the problem, which in this case would be upstream velocity times the relative link scale, uh, which would just be the diameter of our uh, cylinder divided by the viscosity of the fluid, kinematic viscosity of the fluid. So if we're below this uh, critical uh, link scale, then we would uh, tend to have a laminar boundary layer. And that laminar boundary layer is not very effective at bringing momentum to the surface. And so it is less able to counteract this adverse pressure gradient and we get separation at a much smaller angle for the, um, uh, these relatively low Reynolds numbers. We expect separation um, at about 80 uh, degrees. Now for really, really low Reynolds numbers, uh, there's no separation at all. We uh, have the boundary layer attached all the way around the, the cylinder. Um, and this is a, a very slow, what we might call creeping flow. But usually we're not in this regime. This regime corresponds to very, sl uh, very slow flow, but perhaps in very low Reynolds numbers we may, may be. So in the laminar regime, we get uh, separation at 80 degrees. If we're able to go to a higher uh, velocity or same velocity, larger sphere, a higher Reynolds number, so that we're above this critical Reynolds number. Now the boundary layer um, transitions to a turbulent boundary layer somewhere before the separation occurs. And that turbulent boundary layer is more effective at bringing momentum from the free stream to the surface. And that helps to counteract the adverse pressure gradient. And so separation is delayed. And so we can see this in the uh, drag coefficient um, of the sphere. And the drag coefficient um, is similar to our friction coefficient, except now it's uh, relating the total drag force. So in a um, flow, the cylinder will feel a drag force. That total drag force now, um, before we had a shear stress, so in order to keep this dimensionless, when we talk about the dynamic pressure, we need to have an area. This area is the frontal area. So that's the area presented by the cylinder um, to the flow. So if I consider a, a cylinder, my frontal area is the diameter times the length of the cylinder. And this is uh, the drag force is divided by the frontal area and the dynamic pressure or the uh, kinetic energy density. And so this uh, drag coefficient is essentially the velocity analog to the heat transfer coefficient. And we uh, can uh, interpret some of the physics of what's going on with the momentum around the cylinder by, by looking at it. And um, an interesting point here is uh, somewhat counterintuitive, I think. In the case of the flat plate, we, as expected, increased our uh, coefficient of friction uh, when we transitioned to a, a turbulent regime, because now we were more effective at bringing momentum to the surface. But because we delay separation um, in the uh, turbulent regime, when we have a turbulent boundary layer, now we see a coefficient of drag that's relatively constant um, for the laminar regime. 
and drops dramatically when we transition to turbulence because we delay separation now to about 140 degrees from the stagnation point. A reminder that if we follow the flow here, there's a point we would expect it to exactly stop at the front of the cylinder, and that's what we call the stagnation point. So we're measuring the angle from the front uh, axis or front symmetry line of the cylinder, which is at the stagnation point. Uh, and for the turbulent flow, uh, the angle between the stagnation point and separation uh, would be something on the order of 140 degrees. And we would correspondingly see a drop in the drag coefficient. And that change in the flow regime and the corresponding separation, uh, we would expect to have a uh, significant effect on the heat transfer as well. And indeed, we uh, see that to, to be the case. If we consider the position uh, around the cylinder, we can look at the local Nusselt number, now a function of Theta. In this case, it's been um, further normalized by the Reynolds number, again, with a length scale of d uh, to the negative uh, one-half power and Prandtl number to the negative one-third power. I believe this is figure 710 in your book. And for, uh, we look at it for extremely low Reynolds numbers. And this is probably still with some separation occurring, and then moderate Reynolds numbers, and then Reynolds numbers uh, around the transition to turbulence, and then fully turbulent flow. And the fully turbulent flow uh, shows a very strong uh, peak in um, uh, heat transfer coefficient, or Nusselt number, I should say, um, uh, corresponding to this uh, transition to uh, turbulent flow. And these local characteristics of heat transfer are uh, interesting, but oftentimes we're most interested in the uh, global heat transfer from the cylinder. And in those cases, we have a number of correlations uh, to choose from. And again, these are all in your book. I believe this is uh, 752. Uh, 753 and 754. And all of these are interpreted from experimental data. So there's a large amount of experimental data that's collected and that uh, data is uh, then um, transformed into uh, a heat transfer coefficient and then to a Nussel number um, along with the corresponding Reynolds number and Prandtl number, and a curve is, is fit to it. And we'll find, uh, and this will frequently be the case, it's not very convenient to write a, uh, a full expression that encompasses all of the, the data, although the, the third one that we have here really does that. Um, but oftentimes we'll write a simple expression, just the sort of expression we've seen before, constant times a Reynolds number, Reynolds number to some power times a Prandtl number to some power. And we'll just use a table uh, that um, gives different values for these constants and these powers based on a range of Reynolds numbers. And again, we remind ourselves the Reynolds number here is now referenced to the upstream velocity, the diameter of the cylinder, and the uh, viscosity of the, the fluid. And your book gives three different sets of correlations for the cylinder and cross flow. Again, all of these are average. So this is averaged over the entire cylinder surface. And um, the first one they give is by Hilpert. Uh, and it uses a table. Um, then they have a, another uh, re-analysis um, of, of similar data. Um, by uh, Zukoskis. Um, and one thing I want to point out, and this is always true for all correlations, you should always check what the limitations are. So they'll always give some limitations, just like we saw before, Prandtl numbers for the flat plate greater than about 0.6. Um, this 
correlation is valid for parental number greater than or parental numbers greater than about 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is for air, so air, water, oil, those would all be good. Um, lower parental numbers, probably not. The other uh, thing to pay attention to is where we expect the properties of the fluid to be evaluated. So we're talking about the uh, kinematic viscosity in order to evaluate Reynolds number. We're talking about the thermal conductivity and we're talking about the, the Prandtl number. Well, before we were uh, saying that the film temperature was what we we're going to evaluate all of the um, properties for the flat plate at, and that's the case for the Hilpert relation. But I wanted to call your attention to uh, the Zukoskis relation, uh, and it has a slightly different form. We have the constant times the Reynolds number to some power times the Prandtl number to some power, and then this ratio of Prandtl numbers. So we see Prandtl number to Prandtl number at the surface. And so um, rather than defining a film temperature, which was the average of the free stream temperature and the surface temperature, and I should say, again, these uh, cross-flow correlations uh, correspond to uh, an isothermal case, although as we've often found, the constant heat flux case is relatively interchangeable. So for the Hilbert case, uh, we are likewise going to evaluate the Prandtl number, the kinematic viscosity, the thermal conductivity at the film temperature. But for the Zuzkowskis case, we take care of this variation of properties across the boundary layer with an additional term. Now this is a ratio of the Prandtl number in the free stream. So this is evaluated at T infinity and at the surface. So this is evaluated at TS. So everything uh, in terms of evaluating the Reynolds number, evaluating the Prandtl number here, evaluating this Prandtl number, that's all at T infinity. Prandtl number sub S is the Prandtl number at the surface. That's evaluated at the surface temperature. So this is the other frequent form that you'll see for taking into account the variation of properties across the boundary layer. We may have some correlation that would we then modify with a term uh, that considers the ratio of properties. Now again, this relationship has a couple limitations. Um, there's a range of Prandtl numbers it's good for um, and there's a range of, of Reynolds, number, Reynolds numbers. But likewise, once we've determined the Reynolds number, we go to the table, we decide what Reynolds number belongs to, we find a coefficient and a power, we plug in C and M. N, we have two choices in this case, depending on whether the Prandtl number is less than 10 or greater than 10. We plug those in, and then we can evaluate this correlation, again, for an average uh, Nusselt number. And the Nusselt number, again, is reference to the length scale D, so the relevant length scale there is D H bar times D over K, giving us this average Nusselt number. The final correlation that they give is one by uh, Churchill and Bernstein, and this um, does what we said oftentimes was inconvenient before. It tries to take all of the data that's encapsulated in this table and create one uh, equation to describe it. And um, so this is convenient in that we don't have to look up in any individual um, line in a table. We don't have to first evaluate Reynolds number to figure out what the value of C and M is, but it ends up in a much more uh, complicated equation. And like all correlations, it has some limitations. In this case, it's uh, in terms of a product of the Reynolds number and Prandtl number. Uh, and likewise, this correlation expects you to evaluate all these properties at the film temperature. And we can also consider the sphere. Now a sphere, because it's symmetric in all directions, is always in cross flow. And uh, the uh, behavior of the sphere is similar to what we expected in the cylinder. At reasonably high Reynolds number, we'll also expect separation. It will behave as a bluff body. Uh, we just have a different correlation uh, to describe its behavior. And, and there are, I should say, in addition to those listed in your book, many, many correlations. If you look in the literature, your book gives uh, various references uh, at the end of the chapter. 
you can find any number of correlations, many which, uh, of which will be probably more accurate for more specific cases. They may have evaluated a smaller range of Reynolds numbers or uh, considered different uh, details in the experiment uh, that would give a more accurate correlation over a more narrow uh, range of, of um, situations. But the um, uh, correlation that's given in your book for spheres is the correlation by Whitaker. Um, it's given by uh, this equation. Uh, we don't have to go to a table in this case. There's just Reynolds number uh, to define power, the Prandtl number to define power. Again, we see this ratio of properties. Now, now this ratio, again, it's non-dimensional because it's uh, dynamic viscosity over dynamic viscosity. But again, it's a ratio of dynamic viscosity in the free stream to dynamic viscosity at the surface. So evaluating this at uh, free stream temperature and this at the surface temperature. Um, and there's one final correlation uh, that your book gives, and that's uh, a correlation by Rands and Marshall, which is uh, oftentimes used for free falling drops. And it's a little bit simpler version of uh, the, or simpler to the Whitaker formulation. And um, I think your book gives an example of using this in applications such as inkjet printing.